Okay. So, uh, good evening um, and uh, welcome to one more session of uh, uh, a teaching session. Uh, and thank you very much for having me here. My name is Dr. Ishita Sen and I am a nuclear medicine physician. Um, I work at the Fortis Hospital Gur uh, Gurgaon. And today I'm going to be uh, quickly showing you uh, some interesting cases as well as uh, telling you the basics of nuclear nephro-urology, right? Um, so uh, when we talk about nuclear nephro-urology, there are various tests which we use for looking at the renal function. So it depends on the radioisotope or, uh, or the tracer that we are using as to what we are trying to see. So you have uh, different agents which look at the glomerular filtration rate, like, uh, like uh, which look at the glomerular filtration uh, function basically, which includes in the olden days, we used to use chromium EDTA and uh, iodine-131 or iodine-125 labeled iothalamate. Uh, now of all the agents, the most, the pure, uh, glomerular agent is iodine iothalamate. And uh, this was the reason where uh, you could actually get the true glomerular function. Now, uh, with all the other agents, uh, including BTPA, and uh, you, there is some degree of tubular secretion as well. However, uh, closest to an absolute uh, glomerular agent which we can use today is DTPA. Iodine Iothalamate, uh, you could not image the patients. You could only count the patients. So with DTPA, the advantage is that you can label it to technetium and allow us to visualize the images. So you can see it on a gamma cam. With iodine-125 iothalamate, you could only count it using a gamma ray counter. Then you have agents which uh, look at the tubular function. So out of this, again, you had iodine-123 labeled orthoiodote hippuran. Uh, this hippuran could be labeled with both iodine-123 as well as iodine-131. Now we have technetium mag 3 or our own technetium LLEC, which look at the tubular uh, secretion. Then you have agents which are basically uh, very uh, closely bound to the cortical proteins. And uh, these include DMSA and glucoheptanate. So these uh, uh, are attached to the, uh, to the tubular proteins. And so you can actually have a better anatomical image of the kidney. So these are used for uh, looking at scars. So looking at uh, renal cortical scarring or where you want to see a better morphological assessment uh, you use these agents. So there, there may be DMSA, which is the one which is most commonly used. And in the older days, we used to use glucoheptonate. Now, glucoheptonate, about 80% of it is bound to the cortical proteins, whereas about 20% of it is free and it is uh, excreted by the glomerular filtration. So the, at one time, it was glucoheptonate was a, a combination agent. So where you could also look at the glomerular filtration as well as look at the cortical, uh, uh, you know, it was, since it was protein bound, it would also give you a decent uh, uh, structural image. But uh, it was found that it is neither a good glomerular agent nor a good uh, structural agent. And hence now it is no longer used. So it is a technetium DMSA, which is used for looking at renal cortical scarring. So uh, this is basically uh, the list of uh, what I already have explained to you. Uh, so it's important to understand that when it is the glomerular function that you're looking at, you should look for DTPA. When it is a cortical scarring, which you're trying to look for, you have to look for technetium DMSA. And when it is a tubular secretion, like for instance, where you have a patient who has got an acute tubular necrosis, or where uh, you have a patient who is undergoing chemotherapy and has had some chemo-induced acute kidney injury. So in these kind of uh, situations, a, a tubular secreting agent is better. Also, the extraction of most of these tubular secreting agents 
is better. So whether it is MAG3 or LLVC, both of them, you can actually get reasonable uh, assessment of renal function even with deranged renal uh, uh, function tests. So if you have a creatinine of even up to four uh, or a glomerular uh, or a, uh, you know, uh, a severely deranged renal function, even in those kind of images, uh, in those kind of situations, you can get a reasonable assessment of renal function with agents like MAG3 or EC. In children where your there is renal immaturity, again, EC is a better agent than DTPA. Uh, in with DTPA, you where GFR is essential, like for instance, when you're preparing a patient for a renal transplant, you know, as a donor, or uh, you're trying to calculate the G, uh, the uh, a chemotherapy dose or a drug dose based on the glomerular function. So in those kind of situations, uh, DTPA is better. And DMSA is mainly for looking at cortical scar. Sometimes when you have, because a DMSA scan is done uh, almost three hours after injection of the tracer. So it, you're, we are giving the cortical proteins more time to uh, attach to the DMSA. So as a result, when you have three hours, so there is a school of thought which says that in very poor functioning kidneys, DMSA may be a better uh, uh, agent to look for uh, whether uh, this kidney is salvageable or not. So in terms of, uh, uh, of actual cortical uh, function, DMSA may be a better indicator than DTPA because DTPA, the entire assessment is complete within um, you know, 30 minutes. So it, it washes out of the renal cortex very fast. So with DMSA, you can better visualize the renal cortex. However, this is something which is, uh, again, the jury is not out. And uh, even now, the it is usually the DTPA which is used for looking at whether there is adequate glomerular function in a kidney to be able to salvage it, especially in situations where you have a uh, a very hydronephrotic uh, kidney with thinned out cortex. So while uh, this DMC concept was true when we did not have CT or CT urography or uh, MR urography or even for that matter high resolution ultrasound was not used to look at the cortical you know, thickness. So now along with DTPA we always look at the cortical thick thickness. So if you have a papery thin uh, cortex it doesn't matter whether you have 10% or 12% or 13%, that kidney is not going to be salvaged. So uh, it's important to understand and to remember that uh, no decision can be taken just on the basis of one number. So many students and many doctors uh, ask me that what is your cutoff? That how much function do you see on DTPA before you say that this is a non-salvageable kidney? So as a rule of thumb, in adults, less than 20%, and in children less, uh, uh, sorry, in um, adults less than, uh, yeah, in adults less than 20%, or 15 to 20%, and in children less than 10% is considered to be non-salvageable. However, you have to take other things into consideration as well, depending on what is the reason for, is it an acute kidney injury? Is it a chronic kidney injury? What is the thickness of the renal cortex? So you have to look at all these things before you take a decision. So the, the rule of thumb works, but then it has to be correlated with other things. So what are the typical indications of doing a diuretic renogram? So one, of course, to look at relative renal function, especially where uh, one kidney is going to be either, uh, you know, operated on or it's hydronephrotic. So you want to know how much is the contributory function. In obstructive uropathy, to see whether it is obstructed or whether it is just obstructive uropathy or whether it is uh, uh, there is a component of uh, uh, obstructive nephropathy as well. Uh, where is the obstruction? Is it at the PUJ? Is it at the vesicouretic junction? Or uh, how severe is the obstruction? Is it a, a significant obstruction or is it a flow dependent partial obstruction? Of course, to calculate GFR, in renovascular disorders, uh, it used to be used a lot in the earlier days when 
uh, we wanted to look for renovascular hypertension uh, and uh, a DTPA scan with a capital intervention was uh, often used to um, look for uh, hemodynamically significant renovascular hypertension. However, the use of this has slowly come down <coughs> with better uh, imaging techniques with uh, MR, uh, reno, uh, renal uh, uh, angiography and uh, CT renal angiography and even Doppler. Uh, location of kidneys which are small or ectopically placed is again one more uh, indication and evaluation of renal transplant is again uh, one more indication. Now, how do we do it? Well, the prerequisites for doing a PC scan or a DTPA scan is that patient should be well hydrated. Uh, patient, uh, we uh, when you talk about well hydrated, the usual norm now is to give 400 ml bolus, either intravenous or oral, prior to starting the DTPA scan. So, if a patient um, is able to consume um, uh, fluids, then we ask the patient to have 400 ml of fluids just prior to the DTPA scan. Uh, if uh, the patient is not able to uh, take uh, uh, so much fluids per orally, then an IV uh, intravenous uh, 400 ml bolus is given prior to the DTPA scan. Uh, the scan is done with the patient in a supine position. Earlier, we used to have gamma cameras where we could scan the patient in a in a sitting position, and that was actually considered a better uh, uh, modality because uh, gravity assisted drainage would also uh, be part of the process. Uh, the kidneys are scanned from the back nowadays. With most of the cameras being dual head cameras, it is usually not possible to scan a patient in a sitting position. Now, the intravenous injection of the tracer is given at one to, uh, at the zeroth minute, uh, and the dose may vary between one to five millicuri. Immediate dynamic images are uh, acquired for about twenty five to thirty minutes, and uh, delayed static images may be taken up to 6 to 24 hours. This is especially in cases of uh, where you are trying to look for any obstruction. The interventions, uh, uh, the most common intervention is diuretic. And uh, normally, the standard uh, uh, dose is 0.75 milligram per kg intravenously and a maximum of 40 milligram. Now, uh, the, the reason for giving a slightly lesser dose of Lasix is that if you actually give the full dose of Lasix, which is like one milligram per kg body weight, then you end up dehydrating the patient and there is a reflex uh, vasoconstriction because of which there may be a lowering of the GFR. So 0.75 milligram per kg IV is usually what is uh, given. Uh, now there are various protocols which can include uh, giving the LASIX at uh, the 15th minute, which is kind of the middle of the dynamic study. It can be given at P0, which is basically the, the time at which the tracer is being injected, and P-15, which means 15 minutes prior to uh, actually starting the study. Now, uh, there are pros and cons of each of these techniques. So, in a situation where you have a large capacious pelvis or you have a functional obstruction. So you have a patient who's had a hydronephrosis and there they've done a pyloplasty, but even now the, uh, the pelvis is large and capacious. In those kind of situations, giving a, a diuretic little prior to the uh, onset of the study allows us in having a better drainage. Uh, However, there are technical issues which are associated with giving the, the uh, LASIX uh, uh, 15 minutes prior to uh, starting the study. One of the most uh, practical problems is that the patient's bladder usually fills up 
and the patient is not able to lie on the system for the 30 minutes, you know, which is required for doing a renal dynamic study. So often when you give last six, 15 minutes prior, you have to abort the study prematurely. Uh, in children, we usually give T0, which means that you actually uh, just inject everything at once. So this is more of a practical uh, issue because otherwise the child will move. Usually, we prefer to see the renal pelvis before injecting lasics because you're trying to look at subrenal drainage once the tracer has filled up in the pelvis, right? Uh, in patients where you're giving uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme, captopril is now no longer available, so we usually use uh, enalopril or even lisinopril. And uh, in those cases, again, uh, you give a slightly lower dose of uh, 0.7 milligram per kg body weight. Mm. Now, it's uh, the uh, the ACE inhibitor is given if it is given orally, like captopril. We used to give it orally about 45 to 60 minutes before the study. Um, with enalapril, if it is an injectable enalapril, we give it one minute prior to the study, and. Uh, uh, any ACE inhibitors which the patient is on for the, uh, you know, as a part of his drug uh, chart uh, should be stopped for five days prior to the study. And on the day of the uh, of the study, they, he should not have received any antihypertensive drugs. So this is what I'm sure all of you are familiar with, uh, with this, uh, these kind of images. This is a renogram, this is a curve, which you see. So in this, you just to tell you what this is all about. So the first, the top line here is a perfusion scan. So here you can see that you there's nothing on the first image. So the patient has been injected with the tracer. The tracer goes to the arm, into the heart, then into the lungs. So you can actually see the lungs. Then it comes back into the left heart and it comes into the aorta. And somewhere between... Uh, uh, about so each of these images is two second images so you have two second two second two second two second so usually by about the six to eight second of injection of the tracer uh, you should be able to visualize the kidneys uh, and uh, the visualization of the kidneys is usually simultaneous with the visualization of the iliac vessels and uh, cortex is now the DTPA or is traversing through the renal cortex and there's a cortical uptake which uh, uh, usually uh, uh, is the peak cortical uptake is at about three to five minutes and by about five to eight minutes the uh, there is excretion into the uh, into the renal pelvis and by 20 minutes at least one third of the scan of whatever you have injected should have uh, been excreted and there should not be any, uh, uh, there should be at least a 30% reduction in the uh, renal uh, tracer uh, uptake uh, as compared to the baseline. So that is when you say that this is a non-obstructed kidney. And you have these renogram curves, we'll come to that uh, in the next slide. So one, you look at the perfusion scan. So you see that there is a sharp upslope here, which is basically the kidney, uh, uh, the perfusion phase. And this is usually within the first minute. And then you have the cortical uptake phase, which peaks at about three to five minutes and then starts to uh, plateau out. And then the excretion starts at about five to eight minutes. Um, so what is a renogram curve? A renogram curve is nothing but a, 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 a line diagram which shows you the transit of the tracer through the uh, various renal, uh, uh, through the kidney. So uh, this, you can see you have the time, you have the time here and you have the activity here. Activity means that since technetium is a radioactive substance, technetium DTPA, when it is injected into the patient, it emits certain photons. And these photons are then picked up by the gamma camera. So the gamma camera does not emit any radiation. It is the patient who is emitting the radiation. So the patient emits the radiation. The gamma camera actually 
detects the radiation and it plots when you draw a region. So if you if you uh, if any of you have actually visited a nuclear medicine department and seen the nuclear medicine technologist or physician at work, you will see that the the uh, the, uh, the the doctor the technologist will draw a, a, a you know the outline of the kidney and uh, what the system does is it picks up the number of photons which the kidney is emitting in within that region of interest and based on that it plots a genogram curve and then as so like we said this is the initial upslope which is the cortical phase so this is the time activity curve so somewhere around the three to five minutes you will find the peak cortical uptake which then plateaus out to some extent and the rapid excretion starts at about five to eight minutes so this is where we are and at 20 minutes you have something called the p half max which means the the if you look at the counts which are there in the the peak counts the t half max is actually the half of that peak count so t half max should be 0.3 which means the ratio between the or rather i should say t half max should be 20 minutes should be at least 20 minutes and uh, uh, the ratio of the peak counts to the counts at t half max should uh, be 0.5 which means that uh, uh, the, there is 50% of whatever was in the kidney is excreted and that t half max if it is more than 20 minutes there is a possibility that that kidney is an obstructed system then you can actually draw these regions of interest on both the kidneys and, def and define how much each of these kidneys is, uh, is uh, contributing. The Normally, the relative contribution for each kidney lies between 45% to 55%. And you can do the also calculate the GFR or the ERPF based on these regions of interest. So this is a normal genogram curve and you can see both the kidneys this is the same one which we saw earlier. And you can see the nice genogram curve which peaks and then it flattens out. Now, uh, what is the basic funda of doing a diuretic genography? So in a dilated system, there is a prolonged retention of the agent seen because of the reservoir effect. Uh, Sunzumoid uh, injection uh, or Lasix injection allows the accurate identification of patients which are affected by obstruction. So the loop diuretic inhibits the uh, sodium plus and chloride reabsorption and it increases the urine flow and washout. So whenever there is any flow dependent uh, obstruction, like if a, uh, if there is a, a partial obstruction, by giving a loop diuretic, you can actually, uh, you know, get, the, get a better uh, excretion and be able to differentiate a, a, a a flow dependent obstruction from an actual mechanical obstruction. Uh, normally, the radio tracer washout is accelerated, and in obstruction, because of the narrow lumen, it, there is a uh, there's a retention of the tracer proximally. Uh, Lasix is given slowly over a period of one to two minutes. The action uh, starts within about thirty to sixty seconds. Maximal effect is seen at fifteen minutes, and that is why. It is important to have the diuretic renogram run for at least 15 minutes after the Lasix uh, has been injected. There's no point in, uh, you know, giving the Lasix at the end of the diuretic phase because you don't have enough time to actually see the effect of Lasix. So uh, these are usually the reasons for doing a, 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 a diuretic renogram. So uh, most common is when you have a, UJ. So in adults, uh, the most common is when you do an ultrasound or, and you find that there is a renal pelvic dilatation, which may be because of a pelvic PUJ obstruction, which the patient may have had for a long time, or if there is a crossing of, the, uh, of a renal vessel, uh, causing a, a, a functional obstruction of the, of the ureter or if there is any obstructing pelvic mass or an ileal loop diversion. Sometimes you can see ectopic urethral seals, you can see urethral valves. These are more commonly seen in children and also in patients who've undergone a pyloplasty uh, to see the, uh, the residual function of the kidney. 
as well as to see whether this kidney is draining or not and whether there is a you know there's any chance of any failed pyeloplasty or whether the patient requires a further DJ stenting or something like that. So all that thing is seen by a diuretic genogram. Uh, now have a, a, a typical pattern uh, when you look at whether it is a normal kidney or a non-obstructed, I mean, normal non-obstructed kidney, or if it's an obstructed kidney, or if there is a rapid response to fusamide after an initial accumulation, which is basically a type 3A curve, uh, poor response to fusamide, which is an equivocal usually happens where there is a lot of nephropathy as in, you know, along with the uropathy. And of course, uh, a type 4 or the HOMC sign, which actually looks at the delayed compensation. So this uh, shows a delayed double peak. So um, there have been, in, you know, uh, inc incidences where uh, the DNB students have been actually asked to draw the O'Reilly curves. Uh, every nuclear medicine DNB has to draw these. And uh, there are times when even urology or nephrology DNBs and MDs have been asked to uh, draw these O'Reilly curves. So it's uh, important to know them. So this is the type 1 curve, which is a, uh, which is a normal curve. So this is the same uh, renogram curve, which I had shown right in the beginning. The type 2 curve is an obstructed curve. So here, even you give a Lasix and still the uh, there is no drainage from the pelvis. And as a result, there is a, uh, the, it's an upsloping kind of a curve. Type 3 curve, type 3A curve actually happens in a hypotonic kidney. So where you have a capacious uh, renal pelvis post pyeloplasty or in a patient who has had a big fusion obstruction, had a pyeloplasty, but still has a, a, a capacious pelvis. So here, this, these are the kidneys which usually show a gravity-assisted diuretic. So often, if you ask this patient to stand up, the kidney will drain. And uh, in these uh, kind of, uh, you know, renal pelvises, once you give the diuretic, there is a rapid uh, excretion of the tracer. And this is a type 3A curve. Now, the type 3B curve is an equivocal curve. Here, uh, the patient has, um, uh, you give the Lasix, and while there is a dip, but the dip is not, uh, does not reach the half uh, does not reach the half of the maximum count so while there is a slight dip there may not there is still an element of obstruction and these are usually the curves where you have to look for uh, you know other uh, aspects and see before you make a decision whether this is an obstructed system or not and the type 4 curve is usually a high grade obstruction this is called the homsies hump and it is a it shows a delayed compensation. So here, the moment you give Lasix, while there is a there is a small dip here, but then the kidney starts to uh, the renal pelvis starts to fill up again. So this is a uh, a delayed compensation, which is basically a uh, a sign of high grade uh, obstruction. Now uh, it's important uh, to also know what are the uh, pitfalls of uh, of a diuretic renogram. And uh, uh, one of the things which we should always ensure is to see whether the patient is having a diminished response to fusamide. Now, this diminished response to fusamide may happen if a patient has got uh, dehydration where there's a pre-renal cause. So if the patient is dehydrated or if there is a massively dilated, uh, distended bladder. So in like in patients where who have a, a, a neurogenic bladder or who have some bladder outlet obstruction. In those bladders, which are already distended with urine, there may be a, what we call as a reservoir effect. And because of that, there may be a false appearance of a, a PUJ obstruction. So in these kind of situations, it's very important to, uh, to decompress the bladder either by using a uh, uh, a catheter or at least asking the patient to void as much as possible prior to the scan. And if you still see a large bladder, as, as nephro-urologists, you must uh, you know, take a look at the scans and see whether the bladder 
was full right from the beginning or not, especially in situations where there is an element of bladder um, uh, bladder outlet obstruction or a, or a uh, neurogenic bladder. So in those kind of cases, it's important for you to ensure that when the DTPA scan was done or when the diuretic phenogram was done, was the bladder uh, compressed and was it, decompens uh, was it com uh, decompressed or not? So if it was not decompressed, then the so-called obstruction at the pelvic level may be a false uh, positive or maybe a, uh, just a erroneous uh, reservoir effect. In patients who got a massive hydronephrosis with severe renal um, cortical thinning, in these kind of situations, Before we give classics. In patients who got severe azotemia or in patients who are, you know, who have renal immaturity, like in infants. Uh, now, uh, if the like I said before, if the diuretic is given at T0 or uh, even at T minus 15, uh, while the diuretic acts steadily, it may not give you the visible drop in the curve. Uh, this is uh, giving classics uh, prior to. Uh, the start of the study may be useful in patients with uh, azotemia or who have a partial obstruction of the renal pelvis or have got a very uh, big capacious uh, pelvis, especially in patients who already had a, a procedure like a pyloplasty or um, or even in some cases in uh, to look for post-operative obstruction in patients of renal transplant. So um, um, the, the, the sad part of being in a virtual class is that I, I cannot see you. I don't even know whether you're there. So it's all a belief. So uh, uh, had we been in a physical class, I would have asked you to read this scan. But here, so, since I can't really see you, um, the, um, I'll read it for you. So now it's important to for you to understand which is the right kidney and which is the left kidney. So the your right is the patient's right, your left is the patient's left. So here you find that this kidney is your right kidney and this is the left kidney. So you the scan is being taken from the back. So your right is the patient's right, your left is the patient's left. And uh, here you can see that while the left kidney shows normal uptake and normal excretion, you can see that the pelvis is... Uh, visualize at about, you know, four by each of this is one minute study. So one each one minute, two minute, three minutes. So by the third minute, you start to see the uh, the tracer in the renal pelvis. And by about the fifth minute, you can see this is the, uh, all the tracer has actually excreted the renal cortex and come into the renal pelvis. And somewhere out here where you give the LASICs, you find that the uh, kidney has drained completely. On the other side, you find that this kidney, while it is almost a normal sized kidney, there is some renal cortical thinning. There is a medial, uh, you know, there's a photopenia seen in the central region. And uh, this is basically a hydronephrotic kidney. And uh, this takes up the tracer slowly. So while this kidney, you start seeing the pelvis right at almost third minute, here you, you, uh, you don't really see that beak, the pelvic beak, because this is a large uh, pelvic initial system. And you see somewhere towards, uh, this is a post-void image. So this is the 30 minute image. So at this point, you find that the tracer is kind of accumulating into the pelvis, but it re is retained there till few hours. And if you look at the renogram curves, you find that the left kidney shows a normal, uh, a renogram curve, while the right kidney shows a upgoing pattern or a uh, an obstructive kind of a pattern, and you can also see the relative contribution of each of these kidneys, and you find that the left kidney, which is normal size, normal functioning kidney, is contributing about sixty percent, and the right kidney is contributing about forty percent. So, and the delayed images show that there is 
retention of tracer in the renal pelvis. Now, this is another patient who has, uh, if you look at this, so why I put this scan is that should also be, uh, you know, just looking at the these images and seeing a central photopenia does not always mean that this is a hydronephrotic kidney. This is a patient with a renal cortical cyst. And you can see that this renal cortical cyst also shows up as a hypodense lesion. So again, uh, in this kind of a, a situation, you find that there is no filling of this, uh, this central photopenia. So this is a renal cortical cyst, which persists till the delayed images. Obviously, because it is a cyst, it is a space occupying lesion. So it's not going to show any uptake of DPP. So this was a renal cortical cyst. Now this is again a gross hydronephrosis. So here you can see the left kidney is a normal kidney. The right kidney is grossly enlarged. Uh, you can see a faint cortical outline outside and this, there's a large central photopenic area. So this is almost like a bag of water which is there. And uh, on subsequent images, there's barely any tracer accumulation in the renal cortex. In the delayed images, you find that slowly, you know, whatever is the cortical, little bit of cortical uh, function which is there that accumulates the, uh, the tracer and you see all that tracer in the sitting in the pelvis at about two hours. And even at 24 hours, you find that there is no excretion of tracer from this renal pelvis. So again, this is a PUG obstruction and with a high grade obstruction with the practically non-functioning kidney because the cortex is massively thinned down. And you can see that um, uh, on, uh, on uh, uptake, uh, this kidney is showing uh, the percentage uh, uh, uptake is about 28%. Uh, no, what is this? 38%. Now, 38% is too much. Isn't it? I mean, when you look at visibly, this kidney does not look like a salvageable kidney. So why is it? Uh, why is it showing that? Percent? This is uh, one of the fallacies of the Gates method. So when you have a very enlarged kidney because of something called a partial volume effect. So which means that because just because the size of the kidney is large, there is an error which happens in the quantification called the partial volume effect. And um, surgeons have a big problem with this because, uh, you know, the kidney may be showing 38% pre-op and then post-op, once the pelvis gets decompressed, the function becomes 15%. So the, the patient comes back to you and says, Dr. Saab, pehle 38% tha, abhi 15%. This is not right. So this, it's important to understand. And so usually most good nuclear medicine centers will put in a caveat saying that the function of an enlarged hydronephrotic kidney may be overestimated by Gates method due to a partial volume effect. And it's important to take other things into consideration and have a more realistic kind of a contributory function of this kidney before, uh, you know, uh, deciding on the further course of action. Okay, so this is a, a duplex kidney. Now, a typical uh, uh, duplex kidney and with the uh, marine Lenhart's uh, uh, syndrome where you find that the upper moiety is the one which is usually obstructed because the renal pelvis, uh, the, ren the ureter of the upper moiety is inserted lower down uh, and is often obstructed by the uh, ureter of the lower moiety. So here you can see that the upper moiety is showing hydronephrosis, the lower moiety is showing normal excretion and the upper moiety then picks up a little later and uh, in the delayed images, there is some retention in the upper moiety. So this is a child and uh, you can actually see the contributory function of not just EPP, but you can also look at, you know, uh, look at the contribution of each of the moiety. So all we've done here is we fooled the, uh, the system into believing moieties are two different kidneys and it gives us the contributory function of each of these moieties. So you can calculate the contributory function of each of the moieties by creating the regions of interest over the two separate moieties. Okay, uh, this is a crossed ectopia. 
and here you find that both the kidneys are on the same side of the um, of the midline, and uh, this is uh, uh, the one of the kidneys is ectopically placed a uh, little lower down at the pelvic brim, uh, but both of them are on the same side. So this is not a fused cross ectopia. This is just a cross ectopia. Um, no, it's not. This was actually a renal autotransplant. So this was a patient who had a renal autotransplant, which was done uh, on the same side. And uh, uh, this is uh, a, a cross ectopia also looks just like this, except that here we have a history that the uh, kidney was uh, underwent a renal autotransplant. Uh, so this is a DMSA scan. This is one of the scans which is... Uh, given to me by uh, one of my colleagues at uh, PGI Chandigarh. And this patient, uh, uh, you can see both the kidneys so beautifully on a DMSA scan. Okay, now this is a, a child with a vesicoureteric junction obstruction. And you find that, uh, you can see that this kidney, which is here in on the left side, shows uh, uptake initially. And then there is an excretion and all the tracer is sitting in the dilated uh, mega ureter. And there is a cutoff uh, at the level of the vesicoureteric junction. The other kidney is a non-functioning uh, kidney. So he has only one kidney, one functioning kidney with a large vesicoureteric junction obstruction giving rise to a, a hydroureteronephrosis. And this is after surgery and you find that now you get uh, tracer in the uh, in the urinary bladder and this uh, the level this uh, the ureter appears decompressed as compared to prior so this patient had a reimplantation and uh, in the delayed images you find that there is a complete excretion of tracer from this kidney uh, okay so this is uh, okay we we'll skip this uh, this is uh, uh, what is this? Can somebody guess? I can't even hear you guys. But anyways, this is what is called as a cobra head appearance. So cobra head appearance is usually seen in a urethrocele. So in a patient, so right uh, next to the urinary bladder, there is a, a, a rounded ovoid kind of a uh, thing uh, which uh, shows tracer accumulation. And even after the patient voids, there is tracer accumulation in this urethrocele. And this is the reason for an obstruction in the um, in the right kidney. So this is a cobra head appearance and uh, a urethrocele. These are spotters, you know. So sometimes, even in the exams uh, for DNB and uh, DM, you will you may be given these kind of images, which are spotters. Okay, so here we have a patient who has a now this time we have a cross fused ectopia. So you have both the uh, both the kidneys on the same side, and uh, they are actually uh, the lower kidney is also mal rotated. So the renal pelvis of uh, the lower kidney is facing outwards anteriorly and uh, facing more outwards. And you can see that this ureter, you can see this is the ureter of the left kidney, and this is the ureter of the right kidney, which is actually. Uh, crossing over to the other side, and uh, this is a crossed fused ectopia. Pancake kidney again, a kidney where uh, it's a fused kidney, which is usually in the central region, and where you cannot define the uh, the cortex and the medulla of each of the kidneys separately. So this is a pancake kidney, um, and this is the DMSA of a pancake kidney, and you see that it's it just is and blob of activity which is seen in the uh, in the center and these uh, 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 the based on the DMSA or the DTPA scan you could actually define whether all parts of both the these are functioning well or not or is there only one kidney which is functioning okay so this is uh, this is an ileal conduit so you can see that there is uh, both the ureters have been uh, attached to an ileal conduit. So this is a patient who's had a radical cystectomy and an ileal conduit. And you can see that uh, the tracer is all going from the renal pelvis into the 
ideal conduit. Um, this is uh, this was again a very interesting case where the patient had a, what is called as a a, a post PCN urinothorax. So the patient had a, a PCN because of a pleural obstruction, and then uh, post PCN had a urinoma which went into the thorax. So this is a urinothorax which is post PCN. So you can see that this urinoma which is sitting here is in the uh, in the thoracic region. And uh, the, the contralateral uh, left kidney is normal, but the right kidney is uh, 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 is showing a urinoma, which is there above the. And this was pre and post procedure. So the uh, after the uh, the pre and post op cases, you find that the resolution of the uh, the urinothorax. Uh, this is a. Patient who had a urethro ileal fistula. Again, uh, one of the cases which was uh, given to me by PGI Chandigarh. Uh, so, this was uh, so uh, it's if you look at this scan, it's uh, difficult to say that whether this is an ileal conduit, why is it an urethro ileal fistula? So, the point to be remembered here is that with a ileal conduit, you would usually see both the ureter. The ileal conduit here you have only one ureter which, uh, which is visualized and you see the uh, activity in the ileum in the bowel loops and so this was a rather rare case of a ureter ileal fistula which was uh, uh, created uh, post operative i mean per operative so this was a, a per operative fistula which happened and uh, and you can see the tracer in so coming to the second part, which is the ACE renography. So this is a very quick run through of ACE renography. Uh, so the indications for ACE uh, inhibition renography is where you have severe hypertension, resistant to treatment of an abrupt or recent onset, onset of hypertension under the age of 30 years or above the age of 55 years, abdominal or flank gluey, and worsening of renal parameters after ACE inhibitor treatment. So in India, the uh, uh, above the 55 years of age, the most common cause of um, um, of um, uh, of renal artery stenosis is uh, atherosclerosis. In a young patient, while in the West it is fibromuscular dysplasia, in India it is still tubercular aortoarthritis, uh, which is the major cause for uh, renal uh, uh, renovascular hypertension. Uh, so the sensitivity for detecting renal artery stenosis is uh, of more than 70% diameter uh, is about 51 to 96%. The mean is 82%, which is rather dismal. So the major advantage of an ACE inhibitor scintigraphy is to look at the hemodynamic significance of a renal artery stenosis. So often... Just like you see coronary artery stenosis, you will see when while doing an angiography, a coronary angiography, or while doing an MR, you find that there is some degree of stenosis which is seen on the uh, on the uh, on the anatomical imaging. So you will find the stenosis. Now whether that stenosis is causing a hemodynamically significant uh, compromise to the renal function is something which an ACE inhibitor will be able to tell you. Also. In patients who have a worsening of their renal function post ACE inhibitors, uh, and where you want to look at small vessel disease or you want to look at renovascular uh, hypertension rather than looking at renal artery stenosis, so uh, a reno uh, uh, ACE inhibitor scintigraphy is uh, a useful technique. Uh, so the interpretation criteria is that you do a baseline test and then you repeat the test post uh, ACE inhibitor intervention. And the criteria for interpretation is that there should be a worsening of the scintigraphic curve by at least one grade of the O'Reilly's curve. So it's something which was grade, uh, you know, uh, grade three B becomes grade four. So you know that there is a worsening or a grade one curve becomes a grade two curve. You know that there is a worsening of the curve. There is a prolongation of the renal pancreatal transit time. There is an increase in the 20 minute to peak uptake ratio. So, normally, the normal 20 minute as a rule of thumb, the 
20 minute to peak uptake ratio should be uh, less than 0 0.3. So which basically means that 30% of whatever has been injected, not more than 30% should be retained within the kidney at 20 minutes post injection. So if your, uh, uh, you know, if your uh, ratio is more than 0 0.3 uh, or if there is a prolongation of the TH max, so in so that means basically you're looking at prolonged renal pancamel transit time, worsening of the scintigraphic curve, reduction in the relative uptake, or an increase in the 20 minute to peak rate uptake ratio, you have a high probability for renal artery, renovascular hypertension. Now, if you have uh, on your baseline scan, if your uh, kidney is small and poorly functioning, which has got a less than 30% uptake, with a time to maximum activity of two minutes that shows no change with ACE inhibitors. These are equivocal studies. Or if you have bilateral symmetrical abnormalities, such uh, you know studies may have a intermediate probability for renovascular hypertension. So this is one of those where you have bilateral renal artery stenosis. You find that um, the the right sided kidney is practically non functioning. The left kidney is uh, showing a normal function. Uh, you see almost a near normal renogram curve, but post inhibitor, a uh, post ACE inhibitor, the function of the left kidney deteriorates. There is a flattening of the renogram curve. There is a reduced visualization of this kidney. And uh, uh, this is a patient who's had a bilateral renal artery stenosis with a significant renovascular, hemodynamically significant renovascular hypertension seen bilaterally. You can also have a segmental uh, uh, renal artery stenosis. And here you can see that on the captopril scintigram, there is a markedly reduced function seen in the upper half of the right kidney. So it is the segmental artery which, is, uh, uh, which has a renal artery stenosis. Um, so this is again a case where on baseline, you find that the left kidney is non-visualized. It's a non-functioning left kidney. The right kidney is almost near normal. Uh, post captopril there is a worsening of the renal parenchymal. So it's a very subtle thing. If you look at the kidney, you will feel that, okay, why? This looks fine. But the point is, there is no urinary bladder seen. So basically what this means is that the kidney is not excreting anything at all. So everything is stuck in the renal parenchyma itself. So this is a prolonged, markedly prolonged uh, renal parenchymal transit time. And you can, the same is seen on the renogram curve. You can see that the renogram curve has flattened. It is a, almost an upgoing curve and there is no urinary bladder, so no excretion. So again, this is a patient who has a significant renovascular pathology. Coming to the last bit, and that is a transplant evaluation. There's very little uh, uh, transplant evaluation. So when we were residents uh, 25 years back, every patient of, uh, of a renal transplant would undergo a, 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 you know, a DTPA scan on the day two or three of the transplant. And because that set a baseline against which subsequent, um, you know, if there was any problem, um, um, we would be able to assess. So with the advent of renovascular uh, uh, transplant pathologists and their uh, growing uh, you know, competence in being able to differentiate the various reasons of transplant uh, dysfunction, the use of, um, of um, DTPA renogram for transplant assessment has uh, become significantly less. And uh, most of the cases, if we do the uh, the renal uh, DTPA uh, scan either in a patient who's had a, a accelerated rejection where you want to see whether there is any residual function in the kidney or not and in patients where who have uh, uh, an obstructive component. So uh, those are usually the two reasons for doing a DTPA in a transplant patient. So this is a normal transplant kidney Again, uh, you can see the kidney in the right iliac fossa, and uh, you can see that the appearance of the kidney should be simultaneous with the appearance of tracer in the iliac vessels. And there is a rapid uh, uh, upslope, which is the cortical function, and then a 
excretion which happens within about the same way as a normal kidney. Uh, this is a patient with a allograft rejection and you find in a rejection, the perfusion gets both reduced as well as delayed. So this is how you differentiate between a rejection and a ATN or a cyclist point or a, 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 a patient who, where you find that the in a in a in a allograft uh, rejection you find the perfusion is the one which goes first so there is reduced and delayed perfusion you can see that unlike uh, the earlier scan where you saw the kidney appear along with the iliac vessels here the perfusion is significantly delayed and there's a long renal panchymal transit uh, this is um, this is a, a patient with a very poor functioning uh, transplant kidney with a leak. So this is this is actually a leak, a urinoma, which is seen below the uh, the kidney. Uh, DRCG uh, or uh, IRCG, which is called the indirect radionuclide cystourethrogram. Uh, this is basically as part of the DTPA study. You actually ask the patient to void at the end of the DTPA scan. And if the patient has a marked uh, psychoureteric reflux, you may be able to see the, you know, the kidney, which had already cleared out, will now be visualized once more. Again, the sensitivity of an IRCG is very low. So most of the time, the scan which is being done is a DRCG scan. DRCG, you actually inject the tracer suprapubically into the urinary bladder. You ask the patient to void. Now, the advantage of a DRCG is one, the as compared to an MCU, the radiation exposure is far, 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 far less. So um, it's almost 500 times less with a DRCG as compared to an MCU. Second, in uh, unlike an MCU where you require to catheterize the patient, here you can just inject it suprapubically. It's a very small volume of tracer. And it's a more physiological uh, test because the patient is actually voiding uh, physiologically rather than, you know, uh, uh, being uh, 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 voiding because of the catheterization. So this is a patient who's got a left uh, high-grade uh, vesicoureteric reflux. You can see the this is the full bladder and the tracer is reaching up to the pelvis and it is retained in the pelvis and the ureter even after the patient voids. Uh, this is again a patient with bilateral vesicoureteric junction, a uh, vesicoureteric reflux, and you can see that the both the ureters are dilated, and you find the tracer in the renal pelvis bilateral. Uh, the last bit is the DMSA scan. Again, like I said, these are cortically plasma protein bound tracers, and usually used to look at renal cortical scarring. Uh, it's important to uh, know the pattern interpretation in these kind of uh, cases. So an acute pyelonephritis will show as a uh, as a cortical defect with a maintained cortical contour, whereas an organized scar will show as a flattening of the cortical contour. Uh, of course, you can also get the relative size, shape, position, function of each of the kidneys. Um, so um, in a normal uh, DMSA scan, the upper poles do appear less intense because of the splenic impression or because of fetal lobulations or attenuation uh, from the liver and spleen and the colonic band. So it's important to know these normal variants. The central collecting system appears as a photon deficient or a cold area. Uh, so this is what a normal scan looks like. You can see that the upper poles show a little less uptake as compared to the lower poles. Um, this is a patient with a right-sided pyelonephritis, and you can see that there is a defect which you are seeing here. This is at the cortical, this is an acute pyelonephritis, and the cortical contour is maintained. And uh, one year later, you find that the scar has become more organized, and there is a volume loss which you are seeing at the upper pole. Uh, so this is a patient with a high-grade reflux. Um, the DTPA scan of both the kid of the same patient, and you find that this patient has got uh, uh, the left kidney is relatively poorer functioning um, as compared to the right kidney. 
And here you see on the DMSA scan, there is a, a, a scarring which is seen um, in the... So when you're looking at the kidney from the back, your right is right and your right is the patient's right, your left is the patient's uh, uh, left. But when you're looking at it from the anterior projection, you have to cross your hand. So your right becomes the patient's left and your left becomes the patient's right. So here you find that this is the left kidney and you find that there are multiple scars which are seen and you can see the same on the anterior projection. And there used to be something called a pinhole uh, collimator which could magnify these images. Now nobody uses them, but uh, these were beautiful images which we could generate out of a pinhole collimator to look for cortical scarring. Uh, and uh, six months later, you find that the kidney has become a non-functioning kidney. The other kidney has enlarged and there is some compensatory hypertrophy. However, there is some loss of cortical volume at the upper pole of the other kidney as well. Uh, and you see an organized scar at the end of 18 months. Uh, uncorrected, these kidneys uh, will uh, progressively deteriorate. And um, this is a multi-cystic kidney. And you can see this is, so DMSA scan can also be used for looking at the amount of available renal parenchyma. This is a patient with uh, adult polycystic kidney and wanted to see how much is the available renal parenchyma in each of the kidneys. And so DMSA can actually show you this. This is a multiple renal cyst. You can see multiple photon deficient areas in the kidney and these are uh, renal cysts. Bilaterally poor functioning kidneys. Um, this is, of course, a patient who was exposed to a nephrotoxic substance. And you find that there is a lot of background activity uh, which this child has had. Uh, um, and I think we'll skip this. Um, a horseshoe kidney. You can see the functioning band, which is joining both the kidneys. One of the moieties is uh, placed uh, anteriorly, which you can see better on the anterior projection. And the other one is seen better on the posterior projection. Uh, so these are the varieties of horseshoe kidneys, which you can see depending on uh, where each moiety is placed. You have a totic kidney. So this is, again, a patient who has a floating kidney. So when the patient stands up, the kidney goes down. So this is a totic kidney. Um, and you have these ectopic uh, low-lying kidneys which are lying at the pelvic brim. So um, uh, so this is a, a ectopic kidney which has got a, 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 also a malrotated kidney. And then cross-fuse ectopia, we already saw that before. Uh, this is the DMSA of the same patient. And you see both the moieties very visual, uh, nicely seen on the pinhole image. Okay, um, I think um, that's about all from, so this is a, this was again a patient who had a renal trauma and you can see with this, uh, there was the upper moiety is what is, and you can see very sharply the renal uh, trauma and the hematoma which has happened here. The upper moiety is more or less uh, intact. The lower, uh, not the upper half of the kidney is intact. The lower pole and the lower interpolar region is uh, is damaged in the renal trauma. And uh, you can also see the kidneys on a bone scan. So again, another uh, 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 you know, whole uh, narrative where on the bone scan, you can see a malpositioned kidneys. So thank you very much. That is all from me today. If you have any questions, you can ask me now or you could send me an email or you could call me or ask me or you most welcome, I would... I uh, love to meet all of you to our department. Come and see how uh, DTPA scans are done, how renograms are done, how to interpret them, how to scan them. Happy to have you guys there. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all the doctors for joining for today's evening. And the video recording would be uploaded uh, after uh, around the week. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you.